While everyone is gathering, I'm going to go ahead and do introductions so we don't have to tarry too long and we have plenty of time for uh, Q&A. Um, I want to thank you all for remaining for the very last panel of the day. I know you guys are probably in desperate need of more coffee. <laughs> it's back there. Um, and uh, this, in my humble opinion, will probably be the best panel of the <laughs> afternoon. Um, <laughs> Um, my name is Yoon Park, and um, this is panel four on civil society, populism, and micropolitics. And I have a, a definite bias toward kind of the people-oriented aspects of the China-Africa field of engagement, and this panel um, kind of represents a lot of that. Um, so our panelists, um, I'll do just brief introductions now, and we'll go again in order of um, that they're listed in the um, program. Um, I, I just have to say quickly, it is such a pleasure to um, have had these conferences happen every year um, where we get to meet face to face with a lot of our um, colleagues, um, many of whom you know, we've con communicated with only via email and some of whom we've, we've watched as they went through their PhD processes and become doctors. So um, we're, um, it's just, it's such a pleasure. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Isaac Odum. He recently um, received his um, PhD um, in political science at the University of Alberta in Canada. And um, he's going to be speaking to us um, about um, agency in tight corners, um, looking at the Chinese miners and community contestation slash collaboration in Ghana. Um, the next speaker, Lila Buckley, um, is currently with the International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, she's going to be presenting on a, a large group project um, looking at sustainable development, um, China's role in Africa's sustainable development from the perspective of natural resources, rural poverty, and local governance. Um, our third speaker is uh, Richard Idu. He uh, comes to us from the Coastal Carolina University, um, and he's going to be speaking about um, the roots of anti-Chinese populism in Africa. And then our last speaker um, of this panel and of the day um, is Robert, is it Wyrod? Yeah. Um, and he's um, arrived here from Colorado, um, University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, and he's going to speak about um, the generals, what he calls in the generals valley, generals valley, uh, China, Africa, and the limits of developmental pra pragmatism. So I'll hand it over to Isaac. Okay. okay. Uh, let me start by thanking. Uh, Professor Brotigam and the uh, Kari team for bringing me back to Washington. I'm happy to be here because, of course, the conference, but I'm also happy because of the weather. Coming from Alberta, uh, when you see this weather, you don't want to leave. So I didn't bring any jacket. I said, this is it. I'm going to enjoy this. Uh, so, so today I want to talk to you about a um, um, topic that I have been uh, engaging with for some time uh, during my PhD, but also after the PhD. Uh, at the end of the day, I want to make three related arguments. I would want to argue that, number one, uh, we need to, when we talk about African agency, we need to uh, look at it beyond just state actors and to consider uh, other non-state actors and other non-state institutions that uh, have huge impact on how uh, uh, Africans engage China, and the other, and so I'm saying that civil society and community agency is very important. The other point that I want to make is that uh, in our discussion on agency, domestic politics is very important, and that uh, of course uh, the availability or capacity of state institutions uh, to adapt or respond to Chinese engagement is very fundamental. And then lastly, I also want to uh, argue that the agency that is expressed by state and non-state actors across Africa uh, is not, it, it's expressed within socioeconomic context. And sometimes we may think that this is not a kind of agency that we are looking at, but uh, my argument is that uh, we need to 
think about the expression of agency uh, within a context, specifically. Um, so I'll, I'll do so by going through uh, a few things. Uh, I think it's important to conceptualize what African agency constitute, uh, what is it. I think uh, our previous, some of the previous speakers spoke about this, but I'll spend some few minutes on that. And I'll look at the, the, the Ghanaian case study, uh, the involvement of Chinese miners in, in Ghana's uh, small scale mining industry. And then I'll, I'll offer some concluding remarks. Uh, so like most of us know, uh, Increasingly, the theme of agency uh, is becoming very dominant in Africa-China uh, engagement. We are moving away from the predominance of a single story to an era where we are seeing the other side of the engagement. That is how African actors and institutions are accommodating or engaging the Chinese side. And here you have a number of work that has been done on this, and so my work is building on uh, aspect of this uh, work, both on state actors, but also on uh, non-state actors. And I think that's very important. But the other thing that I also want to emphasize is that uh, we need to have a more uh, nuanced understanding of what constitutes African agency. And by this, what I mean is that uh, how does African agency look like? Is it possible that the way and manner in which agency manifests itself, either from state or non-state actors, uh, may not necessarily uh, depict how some of us expect it to be. And, and so uh, my, when I talk about agency, I'm, I'm looking at so many ways by which the African actors exercise or express themselves in terms of their engagement with the Chinese. So you can see, you, you can see it in the form of uh, um, uh, public protest, you can see it expressed in the form of resistance. You can see it expressed in the form of uh, informal and sometimes even spontaneous reaction. But you can also see it in formal settings such as bureaucratic engagement and how some terms, of, terms and conditions in China's engagement when it comes to uh, 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 framework of I mean, loans are negotiated in such a way that pushes, or at least, get mix up, make, it, make it possible for African actors to uh, benefit from those engagement. The question about where can we find, or where can we find African agency, my view is that we have to look at different layers. We can, of course, focus on state elite, and I think there's a lot of work on this, about how African politicians led by their president or prime ministers or, or party leaders uh, uh, make adjustment or at least uh, 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 in some ways dominated by Chinese actors. But we, we can also go beyond that and look at how uh, public institutions are, are created in such a way that they are able to exert some influence uh, on, on, on Chinese or with their Chinese counterpart. But then, of course, we can also move beyond that and look at civil society organizations and, of course, ordinary people, ordinary persons, uh, how they engage uh, in the everyday interaction with the Chinese, uh, as it were. And then the other question has to do with how is this agency expressed? And that's what I, I, I think that's very important because um, we, I, I tend to think about the expression of agency that in such a way that if, whether we are talking about it as resistance or as uh, ability to broker deals that are satisfactory to the, to the African side, we have to be very conscious of the limitations that are placed on the expression of this agency. In other words, uh, we have to be aware of the structures that limit the exercise of these agencies that, that may exist in different spaces, which is why I'm looking at uh, agency expressed in tight corners. If we focus on the fact that, yes, there are areas where Chinese corporations or Chinese investors or the Chinese government dominate, then you are not you are looking at the wrong side. If you, but if you begin to see where agency may be expressed, then, you, then it, 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 it gives you the opportunity to begin to look at how are Africans or African institutions uh, reacting or responding to China's uh, engagement. It is on this note that I want to look at the, at the case study of uh, Chinese uh, miners in Ghana. Uh, as most of you know that Ghana, uh, has a lot of gold, 
in the, uh, in the soil. And so um, it has attracted, if you want, if you look at it from that angle, attracted a number of uh, foreign investors, uh, including Chinese. Uh, what is interesting about the Chinese case is that most of the Chinese uh, migrant or workers or entrepreneurs that have become involved in the mining sector in Ghana are doing so largely in the small scale sector. And um, there's a lot of work on uh, Chinese miners' engagement in, in Ghana. If you want to look at uh, Professor Edu's work on the political economy of uh, Galamse in Ghana, there's a lot of more information on that. I'm, what I'm trying to do is, I'm not, I'm not, I want to highlight not just the environmental or the social impact, but I'm more interested in the response of community members, civil society, and how that is bringing in the state in terms of dealing with this issue that is confronting uh, Ghana. So you would see that I'm, I'm focusing specifically uh, in the Ashanti region, a case study of two mining communities that are impacted by the activities of uh, Chinese miners. Now, uh, you should note that small-scale mining is, according to Ghana law, is reserved for Ghanaians only. So the arrival and the involvement of Chinese miners in the small-scale mining industry in Ghana technically is illegal, right? But it's more complicated than that, and I'll go into that uh, shortly. But what has happened is that over since the mid-2000s, we have seen several thousands of Chinese that have been engaged in small-scale mining in Ghana. And the interesting thing is that small-scale mining in Ghana, which is popularly known as Galamse, was, was, I mean, until recently, was predominantly uh, work done by uh, ordinary people from the mining communities that basically use pickaxe. And, and, and so they dig the land, they, they, get, they wash and they get some gold out of it. What has happened is that with the arrival of the Chinese miners, we now have seen an expansion of the, of the industry away from the use of pickaxe and shovel to the employment of technology, the use of equipment that is very much similar to how large-scale mining is done in the country. So now we are seeing uh, the use of trench drills, uh, wash plant and bulldozers and excavators. And so what could take about three months, a land that could take about three months for local Galamse people to, to dig and get the gold out could now take like a week because they are using machines that were, that were not really, that, that is new to the small-scale mining industry uh, in Ghana. And so, obviously, what is, what, what is this doing is that it is causing deforestation, it is leading to water pollution, and it is uh, really bringing issues of social conflict uh, within the Ghanaian, the Ghanaian context. And so, um, yes, so you would see that uh, in some communities that I consulted for my, I mean, visited for my research, some of these communities are predominantly cocoa-producing communities, right? So there's cocoa. But then what's happening is that the land that was originally uh, used for, uh, for growing cocoa is now being cleared by uh, the Chinese that are working alongside with the Ghanaian, uh, uh, Ghanaian local uh, resident to basically cut the cocoa trees in order to access the land for gold mining. And that is causing problems for those who, who think that this is not the way to go, but obviously it's beneficial for those that are working together with the Chinese uh, to get the best out of this engagement. Um, now, this, my research originally uh, started looking at this, let's talk about from 2012. So in 2012, 2013, it was a big deal. So what happened was that the government set up a tax force that basically uh, deported thousands of Chinese back to China to stop this. But what happened was that, uh, fast forward to 2016, it's like the Chinese went or were deported, but all of a sudden, uh, to me, it's not sudden to me, but to the government, all of a sudden, 
the Chinese are involved in Galamse all over again. So what happened, right? And it tells you that uh, my view is that, and based on my research, those that were deported, of course, some of them went, but there has now been an increasing level of fluid, fluid, uh, increasing level of like movement of labor between Ghana, uh, uh, from, from China to Ghana. So we are, some thousands of Chinese were deported, but a lot more stayed, and some came in. So it's, more, it's, it's a bit more complicated. So in 2016 specifically, two years ago, the media began to put a lot of spotlight on exactly what was going on when it comes to the destruction of water bodies in Ghana. And so one of the things that I want to highlight here is this, that although the government deported thousands of Chinese and destroyed some of their properties, by 2016, this phenomenon was still there. And my argument is that this idea of the involvement of external or foreign actors like the Chinese, it's not just the Chinese, there are other external actors involved in this, it's largely, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's presented as if deportation of Chinese is going to fix, fix it. My argument is that it doesn't matter how many times Ghanaian government deport Chinese miners back to China, what causes or what makes people go into small scale mining is always going to be there if the problem is not dealt with. And this is why that you may think about the deportation of Chinese miners as a way of Ghana expressing its ability to control Chinese involvement in their economy. Ghana is doing so in such a way that it is just a short term fix. And I'll come to this shortly. And so this 2016, uh, sort of response from civil society organization is very fundamental because what happened was that increasingly you saw growing number of media houses, television networks, uh, FM stations, radio stations, alongside other civil society organizations that started the campaign Stop Galamse Now, which was trending on Twitter for a very long time. So what happened was that on the street of Accra, you'd find people walking distributing papers, information about how Galamse or illegal small-scale mining was destroying properties and destroying the water bodies, right? So that was happening. And then, by last year, the government had no option than to pay, do something about this. Well, again, what the government did was, for the first time, which is different from what we did in 2013, was to ban entirely small-scale mining. It doesn't matter whether you were engaged in small-scale mining legally or illegally. A monitorium was placed on small-scale mining. The next thing the government did was to create a tax force, again, which was aimed at making sure that the, the ban on small-scale mining was enforced. So it created the Operation Vanguard, which was, in, which was basically made up of the military, the Ghana Armed Forces, and the uh, police forces joint team to patrol the, the use of technology, the use of drones and what have you, to monitor and to stop, confiscate all the activities that, uh, that all the people that were engaged in illegal mining, including the Chinese. So, so far, as far as I know, since, to, since March, the Operation Vanguard has been able to basically arrest over, over a thousand uh, illegal uh, Galamse workers. This includes about 130 uh, Chinese. Some of these uh, people have been uh, prosecuted, and of course, some people have questions about the sentence that is given to them just by paying fines. Now, where am I going with this? What has happened is that in 2013, what, when the Ghanaian government deported thousands of Chinese uh, uh, workers, what happened was that the, some of the communities in which the Chinese operated they, were, they had become so involved in the community, so they were, they were having marriages and having children. And just last week, this, this documentary came out, which really I'm happy about because it supports some of the arguments that I've been making for a while. And we are seeing that the Chinese have left behind several children that they had with the Ghanaian counterpart when they were engaged in the Ghanaian communities or mining communities. So that's, that's a big deal, that's a big thing that the Ghanaians are, uh, are supposed to deal with right now. So what am I trying to, what am I trying to say with this? What I'm trying to say is that because of the weak legal framework or regulatory framework within which small-scale mining is done, it makes it possible 
for those Ghanaians that are interested in mining to collaborate with their Chinese counterpart to continue to engage in soil skill mining because they do not have, the Chinese legally are not qualified to engage in it, but they collaborate with the Ghanaians who get the access to the concession land and then because the Chinese can pay for it and the Chinese have the equipment to help them dig for the gold. So that's, that's very uh, interesting. But another dimension of this is that those uh, Ghanaians that are engaged in this are engaged in small scale money largely because of unemployment, poverty, and marginalization. And so my argument is that while the Ghanaian government is interested in making sure that it protects its water bodies, it is at the same time caught in the structure of dealing with a situation that makes it almost impossible to solve the problem by just deporting Chinese alone or, or just banning it. Because people are still, even with Operation Vanguard, people are still engaged in, uh, in, in, in small scale mining. So my argument is that there needs to be a, a much longer, long term solution to the idea of uh, small scale mining. Now, just to conclude and to highlight a few things that I've, I've talked about, my, to me it's very important that it took the community members it took civil society organizations, it took some institutions within Ghana to highlight and raise this matter as urgent and important, which caught the attention of state institutions and the government to do something about it. They did something about it or they are doing something about it, but they, they, which is their form of urgency or their form of response, but this is largely, this is largely constrained by some of the contextual or socioeconomic context in Ghana, which includes issues of poverty and marginalization. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, when civil society is strong, they're able to push back. When civil society join forces with the state, they are able to respond to uh, issues that concern them, whether it's on the economic or the social aspect. But largely, what is, what is happening is that um, because this expression of agency and deportation and what have you is happening within the context of what makes people what make people engage in illegal mining activity, the extent to which Ghana will be successful in engaging the Chinese in such a way that China, that Chinese uh, actors do not illegally operate in Ghana is largely limited by other forces within the Ghanaian context, such as poverty and unemployment. And so all those things are dealt with together uh, the way we are fighting illegal mining in Ghana, it's not going to work that much. So Ghana is expressing agency, but it's doing so in very tight corners. Thank you. Lila Buckley. I'm so very pleased to be here. Um, I've been to three out of the four Saiskari meetings, and um, they just get better every year. This, all of the panels have been so inspiring and so diverse and um, just such quality research. It's um, really inspiring to be part of this field <laughs> as it grows and continues to um, improve. And I'm particularly pleased that I've been placed where I was in the panel because Isaac has just done me a tremendous favor of um, giving you a case study that illustrates the broader themes that I want to discuss. Mm -hmm. When I was preparing my presentation, I was lamenting that the research I want to share with you today is this synthesis of three years of work across three different African countries and three different sectors and a huge team of researchers, and there was no way to really share the the rich case study information, but what I'm gonna say is gonna make so much more sense to you now that Isaac has given you the perspective on mining, so thank you for that. Um, so as I said, this research um, has, is a synthesis of work we've been doing over three years. We conducted some 700 surveys, 130 interviews, and 100 focus groups. And so I'm not going to go into the case study data. We have separate reports on that on our website at IAD.org. Instead, for the purposes of today's discussion on the state and governance 
of China-Africa engagements, I'd like to share some of the key insights into the micropolitics of the interactions among Chinese and smallholder actors in the African countries that we studied, and the implications of this for the evolving China-Africa relationship. Through this field work, we were focused on African smallholders, specifically artisanal miners, who we just heard about in Ghana, um, although our case on mining came uh, from Tanzania. Cotton farmers and village level loggers. These are populations that, are off that often operate in what is called the informal economy, broadly defined as economic activity that is not subject to government regulation or taxation. In the sectors that we examined, this can sometimes take the form of illegal logging, illegal mining, as we just heard, or side trading of cotton, which is also illegal. Chinese actors have at times been the subject of criticism for entering these informal markets and engaging in trade with these actors. The critique is that by engaging in the informal economy, Chinese traders are undermining governance efforts by the state, as well as causing social and environmental damage. Today, I'll briefly highlight three questions that we explored related to this. First, how Chinese actors are engaging in Africa's rural economy and whether this differs from other ex actors. Second, how, China's, how Africa's small-scale producers and ecosystems are impacted by Chinese-linked investments in the, info in the rural economy. And lastly, how African states and small-scale producers formally and informally interact with Chinese investments and thus shape their outcomes. I took the directive of no full text slides quite literally, so um, this is my slide. <laughs> You'll just have to bear with my, uh, my narrative here. Um, on the first point, it won't be a surprise to this audience that we found significant diversity related to the strategies, interactions and impacts of Chinese actors within and across the sectors and geographies that we studied. That said, in all three cases, that we found that Chinese investors are employing business strategies that contrast with the established uh, players in the three sectors. In all cases, these strategies have upset the prevailing governance regimes, though the disruptive impacts have varied across sectors. In timber, the Chinese alone created an entirely new trade in endangered Mukula rosewood in Zambia. Their approach included direct sourcing from rural small-scale loggers driven by fast-moving transboundary trade. And this differed significantly from the established logging model built on a logic of stationary long-term investments within the national territory. In cotton and mining, the Chinese were joined by other newcomers, mostly from Asia, but some also regionally. And in these cases, our findings suggest that a newcomer versus established player framework is a more helpful lens to understand the disruptions than one that's focused solely on what are the Chinese doing. In cotton, for example, opportunistic traders from China, India, Bangladesh, and elsewhere entered the market during peak cotton pricing and illegally bought cotton directly from farmers who had been contracted by other established ginning companies. Over time, however, those investors who wanted to remain in the sector, including the Chinese investors, gradually have conformed to governance structures. But that said, these newcomers continue to shape and disrupt the sector through new bit types of business practices, such as paying farmers upfront in cash which was a practice that was introduced by a Chinese company and is now practiced by everyone old and new. What we can observe then is that Chinese actors take part in, but do not necessarily always lead disruptions in these sectors. Despite the diversity of engagements across all sectors and geographies studied, we found that change associated with newcomers was rapid and accompanied by significant impacts. On the second point related to the impacts of these investments in the rural economy, this is where our findings might feel counterintuitive, although per perhaps less counterintuitive now that you've heard the, the mining case study. 
As I mentioned, Chinese engagements in the informal economy in Africa are often portrayed in a negative light. In fact, the informal economy overall is often portrayed in a negative light. It is an area out of reach of government control and thus often class classified as illegal and rife with unsustainable activity. While this may be true, as we heard from Isaac, it's also true that the informal economy supports some of the most vulnerable in society. In sub-Saharan Africa, it generates 90% of employment opportunities in some countries. In rural areas, the informal economy sustains livelihoods of some of the most impoverished populations. And these activities are often rooted in traditional resource and land rights. Our research found that Chinese-linked investments had generally positive, immediate impacts on the livelihoods of the farmers, loggers, and miners participating in our study. These are populations who suffer from multidimensional poverty in the form of food insecurity and lack access to education for, household, for all household members. So they benefited directly from the cash incomes earned from participating in the Chinese-linked trade and investments. These increased revenue flows enabled a large share of our sample producers to directly improve their livelihoods. And they were in turn empowered by the opportunity provided by the Chinese engagements to bypass the formal economy and integrate into the global commodity trade with better financial returns. And this is important because our sample producers in all three sectors overwhelmingly viewed the formal economic structures as exclusionary and unfair in terms of, for example, lack of resource rights, high regulatory barriers, and collusion between industry and government. However, these positive socioeconomic gains were accompanied by high environmental risks across all three sectors studied. These risks included biodiversity loss, for example, risks of extinction of the mucola, long-term soil depletion, and as we heard from Isaac in Ghana, acceleration of water and soil pollution through leaching of toxic metals. In brief, the informal economy is complex, and Chinese engagement in it has both positive and negative socioeconomic and ecological impacts. Whether the Chinese actors have unique environmental footprint compared to other foreign investors depended very much on the sector. Lastly, on the third point about how African states and small-scale producers formally and informally interact with Chinese investments, as just mentioned, we observed how rural producers across the sectors have exercised agency to adapt and take advantage of the new commercial landscape created by Chinese and other new newcomer traders and investors. On the Chinese actor side, a commonality observed across the three sectors is the adaptability of the Chinese players to a shifting regulatory context and very nimble business strategies employed. Tracing how the value chain, chain evolved in these three sectors over the last decade, we witnessed that the Chinese players constantly changed their business model and their place in the value chain in response to shifting political, regulatory, and economic landscapes. On the side of the state, as we've heard from Ghana, um, regulatory responses by national governments were consistently designed around the logic of classic business strategies used by established players in the formal economy, in a, in a sense, demonizing the informal realities. In all three sectors, this approach has proven inadequate. In the face of the disrupting business strategies employed by the Chinese and other newcomers, the governance systems were too slow in design and implementation, over-reliant on industry self-governance, and insufficiently innovative to address the social, economic, and environmental trade-offs. Overall, the government's response has achieved limited success in all cases, and at times, not only doing little to address the environmental concerns, but also harming the interests of the small-scale producers. To summarize, our research points to the role of all stakeholders, African, Chinese, and others, in co-creating new commercial landscapes in each sector. 
the unique business strategies employed by Chinese and other newcomers in some cases do indeed disrupt the existing governance systems. At the same time, local actors, from willing producers to helpful facilitators to predatory elites to supportive officials, um, demonst all demonstrate the agency to adapt to these disruptions. In this way, the local and Chinese actors co-create an evolving commercial landscape, and this landscape is not well integrated into the formal governance system. In this process of interaction, adaptation, and evolution, environmental sustainability is often only given a cursory consideration. In conclusion, if we want to do better by the environment, by the rural producers, by the Chinese investors, and by those attempting to govern these engagements, this research suggests two ways forward. First, Capturing the evolving China-Africa relationship requires an understanding of the reality that lies in the informal and formal interactions between Chinese and African actors, and between what is written in policies and regulations and what is practiced on the ground. Second, so-called Chinese investment and its outcomes are the product of distributed agency among many actors. The complex interaction between all stakeholders demonstrates the need for research and policy approaches that account for the heterogeneous nature of China-Africa commercial relationships and their respective leverage points. For example, advocacy aimed at the Chinese market, specifically, will likely prove more effective for tropical timber than for cotton or small-scale mining. As we heard from Ghana, sending the Chinese away didn't solve the problem. In contrast, improving local governance through increased capacity, aligned incentive structures, and better coordination across the diversity of actors appears to have universal, be universally useful. And this is especially true in cases where investors from other emerging economies are also entering the space. Taking this approach, we can more easily avoid research that feeds the politics of blame and instead more usefully explore China-Africa engagements and the governance of them in the context of a diversity of mutually constituted relationships in an uneven global economy. Thank you. Thanks, Lila. Our next speaker is Richard Aydu. Thank you very much, uh, and I would like to say thank you to uh, Professor Bradingham for uh, inviting me. Thank you to Marie for juggling all those uh, thousands and thousands of emails. Uh, I, I must say uh, this gathering is gradually becoming uh, a family gathering, and Carrie is almost providing that home for the family. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very exciting to, to be here and to share with you uh, part of uh, a book that I, I co-authored in uh, 2015, uh, talking about uh, trying to trace the roots of anti-Chinese sentiments. Uh, as we all know, we, we've seen sort of a fast uh, movement of issues on China-Africa relations that we always have to almost go back and then uh, update it tack it into history and then just see how uh, the changes are very much uh, useful for the ongoing research. Uh, I have to say, as China is increasing its presence in, uh, in, its presence in Africa, and we are laying roads, building structures, uh, putting bridges up, and as we heard today, even engaging in Kung Fu diplomacy, uh, <laughs> we also are seeing this emergence of uh, this phenomenon of anti-Chinese uh, sentiments, uh, which are very much whipped up by images like these that uh, cut across African screens. And so seeing this on African screens uh, and uh, hearing and reading about them in the newspapers uh, very much informs uh, this growth or surge in anti-Chinese uh, populism. I'm very glad that uh, I sort of had two cases uh, to research cases that very much informs uh, how uh, 
this is taking place. I have a few pictures here that show this. Uh, over the years, you can see uh, images of uh, Chinese that are being uh, accosted by the military or put in the newspapers uh, as being wanted uh, across Africa, so from Ghana, Tanzania, uh, and then also deporting uh, these uh, Chinese out of the country as uh, was very much portrayed in Isaac's uh, research. All these are uh, various cases that indicate uh, the surge of anti-Chinese populism. And for one that uh, ended up being very much uh, fruitful in its uh, impact uh, that we heard so much about, that was the Sata case uh, from Zambia. So picking all these uh, images very much that are put on African screens highlights what actually informs uh, African uh, anger towards what uh, China is doing. So. I'd have to start by saying uh, a few things here, that anti-Chinese uh, populism is emerging uh, as we get uh, lots of Chinese uh, entering into Africa and invest in various uh, industries, and also not just various industries, but then uh, live amongst the Africans, and then that interaction has created lots of friction uh, as time goes on. Now, what is important about this research? Uh, it helps us diversify the discourse. In uh, China-Africa relations, gradually, especially in the West, we've come to uh, almost perceive it as one that uh, has almost dominant favorability, that almost everything about China is loved in Africa, that everything that is Chinese uh, uh, happening in Africa is perceived as either positive or uh, there's a need to be nudged to look at the negative uh, aspect of this. So, uh, the idea of looking at uh, anti-Chinese sentiments very much diversifies this discourse and also emphasizes different elements of it, the complementary and then also competitive elements of this. Now, what uh, is interesting uh, in our analysis is the idea of how anti-Chinese populism has led to uh, certain changes in governments or impacts that have been made as a result of uh, local entrepreneurs or domestic uh, political entrepreneurs taking uh, this and then bringing, uh, making it uh, impact certain policies or changes uh, in, in government. And so what uh, I do in this research is to emphasize uh, certain patterns and variations of uh, African uh, public perceptions uh, and opinions on China. And here I, I do uh, look at different uh, surveys. There are broad use of different surveys uh, on public opinion uh, about what China is doing in Africa. So I, we take a look at uh, the Pew Research Center survey. Uh, I also look at different surveys by media uh, companies uh, and other researchers uh, across board. I just uh, took this uh, out of the book as uh, an example of the surveys that we look. And we probably can tell from this that uh, China has very much overall positive perspectives uh, when it comes to looking at uh, public opinion uh, across the world. So there is this broad embrace that we talk about that actually uh, exists. But within this broad embrace, we also have variations. So variations that emphasize uh, changes uh, across board. So from one region of Africa to uh, another region uh, within the continent, there are different variations uh, in terms of how uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese engagements are uh, perceived. And so when you take a look at uh, the data very carefully, uh, which we often just look at the favorable uh, elements, when we look closely, we can see unfavorable elements uh, in there and, and try to understand how uh, these uh, elements are, are occurring. And, and in that process, we also uh, perceive uh, the opinions uh, of uh, these African states uh, and, and see how there are some uh, variations uh, that are taking place in uh, different ways. So for instance, if you take a look at uh, data that was collected by Pew Center, uh, 92% in 2007, 92% uh, embraced or perceived China favorably uh, in uh, 
uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and that same percentage uh, holds uh, when you look all the way uh, down to 2014. Uh, so seven years later, you could see uh, that hold. Now, but then in other parts uh, of Africa, that uh, changes uh, based on how activities, uh, the activities that are taking place uh, in these uh, regions or countries. Now, what is the problem? The problem here is that when we take a look at these uh, statistics or we look at these uh, uh, data and patterns, we tend to look at China as a monolithic actor. So we tend to look at China uh, as a unitary actor that, uh, that very much excludes the various uh, entities that exist within uh, the actions of the Chinese. So we don't uh, perceive China in terms of uh, the operatives, the various operatives, individuals, and organizations that exist uh, within it, which uh, in this case neglects the complexity of how we perceive uh, uh, China in, uh, on the continent. And then secondly, we also have this almost characterization of uh, China, of, of Africa, as a unit instead of uh, perceiving Africa in its changes and uh, the patterns that had taken place uh, over the past uh, two decades. And so this gives us a sense of how we collectively sometimes ignore the individual, uh, uh, individual aspects of what China is doing or looking at uh, Africa as a unit, a single unit, and, and not necessarily one that is, uh, uh, has different entities and has gone through different changes over the past few decades. What I do is also uh, tag, look at the various sources of anti-Chinese uh, populism. And we can tell that uh, these sources are largely informed, or they stem from uh, different myths and realities as well. The myths and realities, are, as we have seen in several of the presentations and several uh, research, uh, uh, has always been looking at certain things that uh, China is doing that is always perceived by the locals uh, in a different light. So, for instance, uh, looking at the impact of uh, cheap Chinese goods typically comes up in these surveys. When you take uh, a look at the Pew surveys or you look at the recent uh, Afrobarometer, uh, highlights of cheap Chinese goods, uh, in particular textiles, uh, come in, often show up as part of the sources of uh, anti-Chinese uh, uh, sentiments in these places. And I do emphasize the idea of textiles uh, by uh, one experience that I, I had uh, in Accra, just with my fellow Chinese uh, taking a tour through the Makola market, it was a very intriguing experience uh, when we walked through uh, a cloth seller who, once she saw me walking with the Chinese, immediately said, don't come near me, right? And, and started pushing us away. And, and that was uh, a very interesting experience. So I pushed her a little further to ask why. And she said, well, I don't want the Chinese near me because if they come here, I know they have cameras and they take pictures of the patterns, and the next time they show up, they have a cheaper version of my work, uh, which would end up outcompeting me. So this was an eye-opening experience, uh, which uh, emphasizes how uh, angry uh, most of these uh, sellers are when they are looking at cheap Chinese products that end up competing with them. And then other, uh, other impacts were also felt when we talked about cheap Chinese products that go into constructions. Uh, the top building uh, is, these are buildings that if you've been to Ghana, you're very much uh, conversant with. The top building is the Ministry of Defense that was constructed by a Chinese company. And I had the honor to be able to walk through it uh, when it was being con constructed. So a few days before it was handed over to the Ghanaian government, uh, I, I went through it and I saw fixtures that were falling off and part of the comments, and, and so this was a new building that was being put, it, uh, put up, and part of the comments uh, that came out from the Ghanaian constructors were, well, uh, we wish we had uh, better products from the West, uh, but uh, this is what we have to deal with. And, and, and I said, well, but at least it's something up there. And they said, don't take pictures of them. So I ended up walking out with the knowledge of uh, this idea of uh, how uh, 
uh, locals are angered by the Chinese, uh, the cheap Chinese products that are going into constructions and, and buildings. Uh, secondly, I talk about uh, taking jobs and businesses from locals, which is often seen in the surveys. Uh, there's also one other distinct, which is extraction of resources. We've heard uh, that from Isaac, uh, uh, engaging in galamse and illegal mining. All these are activities that point to uh, disregard for local rules and uh, policies and precepts. And then we also have uh, another source, which is sort of the connivance between elites and uh, the Chinese that's perceived as uh, one way that easily angers the locals and, and gets them uh, to react. Now, what is interesting about this uh, in the research and uh, done very well in the book is highlighting how these opportunities uh, become fodder for uh, local political actors to engineer themselves into power or be able to throw out a government out of power. So as much as these uh, anti-Chinese sentiments and populism uh, uh, fervor exist, they also create uh, some contentiousness that can easily be harnessed by these local actors and used uh, as a catapult uh, to get them into either power or uh, to be able to disrupt the status quo uh, uh, at any point in time. And what I do is very much fall back on trying to test the efficacy of Tilly and Taru's uh, argument on contentious politics and highlighting uh, the importance of state capacity and also the level, the extent of democraticness. And so this leads me to creating uh, two uh, categories, one looking at the open and electoral uh, regimes, which uh, very much took three main uh, cases, and I have a few more cases uh, in the book that emphasize this. The, uh, the case of South Africa, which is a one-party uh, dominant electoral system, one that is largely uh, uh, controlled by the ANC, creating opportunities and threats uh, that uh, deal with diverse media, having diverse media outlets, uh, associations and organizations that enable uh, the local people and the popular masses to be able to air out their grievances against China. Hence, there is no major outcome in this uh, regard. Same with Ghana, which has also a competitive two-party electoral system that provides uh, diverse media and outlets uh, for uh, opportunities, uh, the opportunities uh, uh, for uh, uh, people to be able to air out their grievances uh, against China, that also very much does not uh, produce any major outcome, as you can see. And same in the case of uh, Zambia, which has become that major case that we all uh, have heard so much about, the competitive single party electoral system was one that offered several uh, uh, opportunities for uh, other op uh, opposition parties to contest with the status quo. And hence, with those limited controls and persistent uh, 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 willingness by the opposition to push back, uh, we saw Michael Sata being able to get elected after three tries, uh, 2006, 2008, and then got elected in 2011. So that showed an outcome uh, in that regard. And then the second group uh, of countries, the, those uh, countries are largely closed authoritarian regimes. And uh, those regimes very much highlight a single party uh, dominant political systems that uh, do not have uh, clear uh, opportunities for the masses to be able to air out uh, their grievances against China. And with the capacity to be able to make the changes that uh, uh, they need. That also, obviously, as tested, did not pro, uh, produce any non, uh, any major political outcome. And then same with uh, Angola. Angola, which is also uh, a closed uh, authoritarian uh, regime with restrictive uh, media uh, access, made it difficult for the, that outcome to uh, very much result in a major change. So to just wrap up, because most of uh, the arguments are very clearly laid out in the book, to wrap up, 
there are diverse uh, economic opportunities for China. Uh, and as China works with different regimes, uh, different opportunities are created for local actors to be able to uh, engage uh, in uh, ways of either taking what uh, anger exists to be able to uh, catapult themselves into power uh, or to be able to try as much as possible to emphasize certain weaknesses that exist within the our local uh, areas, hence emphasizing the agency that these local actors have to be able to make changes within their own uh, political systems. So the anti-Chinese uh, populism uh, is one that becomes uh, effective uh, from the research that uh, I have conducted. It becomes effective as long as there is some uh, energy behind it, palpable energy that projects or catapults these actors into uh, political change. Thank you very much. And our last speaker for the day and on this panel is um, uh, Robert Wyra. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, well, folks, I think Madalena stood between you and lunch, and I stand between you and dinner and even worse, wine. So that is a serious challenge. Um, but, and I admit it's kind of hard to go last, uh, but I, it really has genuinely been such a pleasure to listen to everybody's presentations today. And, you know, really more than that, it's just been a true education for me. So really thank you all for your research and your insights and, um, it's, and for allowing me to participate in all of this. So, um, so let me begin by just full disclosure, I'm a sociologist, and um, as this, yeah, okay, we've got <laughs> some fellow travelers. Um, and as a sociologist, uh, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is understanding how the practice of development is intertwined with social inequalities. Um, and in my presentation today, I'm gonna take you to uh, a village called Kapeka in central Uganda. And I want to tell you about Kapeka because I think it provides much insight into how China's development assistance to Africa is embedded in in altering social inequalities based on politics, race, ethnicity, class, and gender. Um, and at the end of my presentation today, I'm going to try to pull back a bit and discuss some of the broader insights of my research regarding how we conceptualize China as a development actor including exactly what I mean by this phrase, developmental pragmatism. And I think there may be some interesting kind of overlaps with our fantastic keynote address today as well. Um, so let me begin. Um, here is Kapeka, and for the last two years, just bigger picture, I've been studying China as a development actor in Uganda, and I've been doing research at four different field sites. Um, a Chinese central government control, uh, funded hydroelectric dam, a Chinese provincial government funded agricultural project, a Chinese provincial government funded industrial park, and a metal factory owned by a private Chinese businessman. And so today I'm gonna focus on the village of Kapeka, which is the site of the industrial park. So about a decade ago, this man, General Salim Saleh, the brother of Uganda's current president, Yoweri Museveni, began collaborating with a Chinese businessman, Shenzhong Yuang, to develop a 4,000 acre, acre portion of land in Kapeka. And so this land used to be a farmer's collective, but the general acquired the land in a suspicious manner after the protracted civil war in Uganda in the 1980s. So together, the general and Mr. Shen have developed several different projects on this partial of land. Um, so initially, they focused on growing cassava and maize. And when these projects failed, they turned to food processing, building a small tomato sauce factory. And this also failed. And in 2013, they constructed a large facility for making roof tiles, a venture that proved successful. So for over a decade, the general and Mr. Shen have been slowly building this Uganda-China business partnership that has shaped life in Kapeka. Now, in December 2015, um, uh, this partnership was dramatically expanded. 
Uh, President Museveni announced that Kapeka had been chosen as a site for Uganda's first Chinese-funded industrial park, the Liaoshen Industrial Park. And so this park is a partnership between the government of Uganda and the Liaoning provincial government in China. And the project also involves two large private chi uh, Chinese investors. So in this sense, the park is an example of one of the many unofficial special economic zones in Africa that involve partnerships with a Chinese provincial level government. And I should also note that it's a project that the Ugandan first family has a very large personal stake in. So at the groundbreaking ceremony pictured here in Kapeka, the Alaunian government and the private Chinese investors pledged $600 million of development aid in the next five years. So the first project was a, is announced as a truck assembly plant that was pledged to create 10,000 new jobs for Ugandans. And in the Ugandan and Chinese official statements, the park is explicitly framed as a cutting edge form of development assistance from China to Uganda. And just to give you a sense of the ambition of the project, here's a billboard that was put up about a year ago that shows the scope of the project, um, ideally. And then this is just a photo I took last August of some of the factories that are under construction. Probably a architectural style that's very familiar to many of you doing research on China and Africa. Um, so since 2015, I've conducted five months of ethnographic field work in Kapeka, and today I'm just gonna focus on my 2015 field work, which includes 57 interviews with villagers, 54 of whom had worked on the Chinese projects. And I'd like to make the case that these data are unusual because they provide a sense of the social foundation on which this large industrial park is being built. And this is a perspective I think we rarely have on large China-funded projects in Africa. There's often this assumption that, that they're being built on kind of a blank social slate. Um, so let me turn to my findings, and I'm just gonna focus on three themes that emerged from my research. So the first one is about how these projects are intertwined with existing political inequalities in Kapeka and in Uganda more generally. So more than any place that I've ever done research, and I've done research in Uganda for about 15 years, um, there was a palpable sense of trepidation among the villagers. So everyone we spoke with was concerned about the possible repercussions from speaking with us. And the villagers and workers were keenly aware that Kapeka had become a politically sensitive location involving the two most powerful men in the country, the general and his brother, the president. Um, so I actually experienced, experienced this climate of fear myself very early on in my field work. Um, on my first stroll into the General's Valley along a public road, the armed security guards at the General's compound summoned me as I passed. They thoroughly questioned me and said I couldn't walk past the compound again without the General's permission, which I did eventually receive. And then at the end of my first week in the village, a well-meaning resident warned me that my interviews were raising a lot of suspicions and that I should be very careful not to accept any food or drink from strangers <laughs> because I was at risk of being poisoned. Um, so I admit that was actually, I was shaken by that, but I also kind of knew as a white American that I was somewhat insulated from these dangers. Um, others, however, recounted stories that made clear that villagers' concerns were justified. Two different men, for example, said they were arrested and then jailed for weeks after they challenged Mr. Shen about labor practices. And so this partnership then between a very powerful man, the general, and Mr. Shen, who was given much leeway in conducting his business affairs, was unsettling and frankly quite scary for the villagers of Kapeka. Um, and importantly, this climate of fear and intimidation was emblematic of a deeper issue, namely the lack of accountability that this partnership was based on. And then given the history of the suspicious way that the general acquired this land, many villagers were deeply resentful of this lack of accountability. So now I'd like to turn to the second theme. Um, and I'm gonna talk about what is, was, was actually the most prominent theme that emerged from my field work. And that was uh, villagers' discontent with the Chinese labor practices. Um, so first I'm gonna summarize these sentiments and then I'm gonna turn to how they were tied to these new class inequalities or new class distinctions. Um, 
So of the 57 villagers I interviewed, 56% had unequivocally negative opinions of the Chinese. 35% had opinions that were largely negative, but somewhat more mixed, leaving only 9% who felt the Chinese presence in Capeco was positive. And the main factor, and this will be familiar to many of you, is that driving these negative opinions was these labor practices. And the common refrain was that the hours were too long, the pay too low, there were very unfair wage penalties for low productivity or missed work, and the treatment by Mr. Shen and his Chinese colleagues was demeaning. Um, so for example, a man who migrated from northern Uganda and worked in this brick factory but then quit told me, quote, the conditions are abnormal. They are kind of abusing people at work. They say, you Africans don't know how to work. And if there's any slight mistake, you're just fired. You work as if it's, kind of, it's a kind of punishment. You can't exercise your freedom. So 19 Kapeka residents are also told me that they witnessed or personally experienced physical abuse at the hands of Mr. Shen and other Chinese managers, especially slapping and hitting. Um, so now I should note that these labor abuses did provoke conflicts between the workers and the managers, which is kind of reminiscent of this theme of agency that was in the very first uh, presentation. And so this, in combination with the failure of the initial businesses, led to shifts in the labor practices. So initially the goal was to employ local uh, workers from the village. However, some workers from Kapeka were not afraid to challenge Mr. Shen, and I was told that he came to view them as too difficult to manage. And so this then spurred a shift to a new business model, light manufacturing using migrant labor. Um, and then in a moment, I'll describe how this shift to migrant labor strategically exploited existing ethnic tensions in Uganda. But before that I do that, I just did want to touch on these new class divisions that were emerging. Um, so the general and Mr. Shen worked primarily through Ugandan intermediaries who managed the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and villagers' views of the managers were decidedly mixed, with many saying the managers consistently skimmed uh, money from their wages. And three Ugandan men were the key go-betweens, and based on my fieldwork, they had indeed prospered from their positions. So one of these men, who I call Stephen, stressed that Kapeka had developed significantly due to the Chinese presence. And Stephen's personal gain from his role as a key intermediary was evident when I visited his home. So most of the housing in Kapeka is really quite rudimentary, just like this. Um, but one area, however, was significantly nicer and nicknamed Kololo after the capital city's most elite suburb. And at the fringe of this area was Stephen's home, a substantial five-room brick home with windows and a tile, tiled roof. And Stephen was clearly uncomfortable with my visit and he didn't invite me in, which is a rather blatant break of protocol among Ugandans who pride themselves on their manners and politeness. And so these new class inequalities were not lost on most villagers, and some residents explicitly framed them as a problematic outcome of the new Chinese presence in the village. So finally now I'm just gonna to turn to the third theme, which is about ethnic and racial relations, um, and how these Chinese Uganda projects shaped these tensions in, in the village. So in 2013, Mr. Shen and uh, the general created this now successful brick factory that you see pictured here. And as I observed, Mr. Shen only employed workers he brought from far northern Uganda. So these workers, who were all men, lived on site in barracks and had severe restrictions placed on their after work mobility. Thus, the general and Mr. Shen resolved their earlier labor disputes, disputes with local workers by essentially replacing them with migrant workers from northern Uganda. And so as those of you who are familiar with Uganda, you know that these tensions between northern and southern ethnic groups are long standing. And they date back to the British colonial indirect rule that relied on the southern Baganda tribe as mediators. And Kapeka is, is in the heart of Buganda, the home of the Buganda people. And thus, these current labor practices exploit these long-standing ethnic tensions, further entrenching these social divisions between northern and southern ethnic groups. So finally, let me just say a word about the important racial relations. 
um, because the majority of residents I spoke with in, in Capeca were unequivocally negative in their assessment of the role of China in Ugandan development. And an indication of the racialization of these tensions was how the word obudu, which means slavery in Luganda, was frequently used by villagers to describe their relations with the Chinese. A man who was employed on several projects over the years, for example, told me, quote, Mr. Shen used to treat us like slaves because a slave is someone who doesn't have a choice. And I should, what's important to underscore is that these racial tensions were pronounced in part because they were embedded in a much longer strain of Ugandan-Asian con racial conflict. So in the 1880s, approximately 30,000 South Asian laborers were brought by the British from British India to construct the Ugandan railway. And after the railway was completed, some South Asians remained and they became a vital part of the Ugandan economy. Their success, however, um, was, res uh, was resented by some Ugandans and this made South Asians a very convenient scapegoat for uh, Ugandan politicians and this culminated in their famous expulsion in 1972 by Idi Amin. So the Museveni government did welcome South Asians back starting in the late 1980s and many South Asians have created powerful business conglomerates, including agricultural processing facilities in the Kapeka region. And so the point to stress here is that current China-Ugandan tensions in Kapeka, therefore, occur on soil well tilled for racial conflict. So now, if I had a little bit more time today, I'd um, try to pull out and talk about the implications beyond the General's Valley, and specifically to kind of compare these, my findings, with other research on China-funded special economic zones in Africa. And especially the interesting similarities I've seen related to labor practices and racial tensions. And um, if we have time in the q and I'm happy to talk about that. But I'd like to conclude instead by saying a few words about the really broad implications for understanding China as a development actor. So within my own div uh, discipline of sociology, recently there's been efforts to conceptualize development as a unified field of diverse actors, including states, NGOs, and multilateral institutions. And as sociologists Arnold Thornton and his colleagues have compellingly argued, there is what they call a cultural model or shared set of beliefs and values that unifies these diverse actors around the appropriate goals of development. And they call this developmental idealism. And they provide a comprehensive list of the attributes valued in this developmental idealism model, including free markets, democratic institutions, human rights, gender egalitarian, egalitarianism, among other things. And they argue that developmental idealism's values are now linked to a global model of development and a universal prescription of how these values and beliefs are seen as the causes and consequences of global development. So when we look at China as a development actor in Sub-Saharan Africa, it seems that a different story emerges. And based on my fieldwork in Uganda and my kind of reading of the China in Africa literature, I argue that China is very much an awkward fit with developmental idealism. So development idealism is rooted in a belief that certain values especially those tied to more socially inclusive and socially equitable societies are fundamental drivers of development, including economic development. And these values are not at the center of Chinese development in Africa. Instead, China foregrounds values of South-South friendship and mutual benefit predicated on a policy of non-intervention. And the links between these values in more equitable and inclusive societies is ambiguous at best. And instead, China is focused on a more narrow, business-centered form of economic development, what I call developmental pragmatism. And just to try to like bring this to, I don't know, to conceptualize it a little bit clearer, as I try to kind of show in this diagram here, I don't really see any overlap between developmental idealism and developmental pragmatism. But both development ideologies do overlap with global capitalism. 
And I see this overlap as more significant with developmental pragmatism because values play a minor, if negligible, role in the model's beliefs about what is necessary to fuel development. And so I think my fieldwork in Capeca provides a window onto the actual impact developmental pragmatism is having in one African community. And it reveals that a narrow focus on business develop, development has troubling ties to existing social inequalities based on politics, class, and ethnicity. And significantly, all of these tensions are now viewed through a frame of amplified racial differences that has deepened problematic views of racial others held by both Chinese and Ugandans. And so this is a rather pessimistic view of developmental pragmatism in Africa, and I do want to qualify it to some extent. Um, so first of all, like nearly all of the official and unofficial China-funded special ec economic zones in Africa, this one in Kapeka is very much in its infancy. Um, as more factories open, the dynamics I've observed may indeed shift. Um, and in addition, the Kapeka Park is a project of a, pro a provincial level government, not the Chinese central government. And there's evidence that projects of the central Chinese government do include additional social development projects, such as health clinics, and they can be more responsive to a community's needs. And I've seen this dynamic myself in my research. It's a large China-funded hydroelectric dam, dam in northern Uganda. However, I think it would be a mistake to assume that this represents a commitment to social values of equality and inclusiveness in any fundamental way. Thus, continued critical attention to China's new role in Africa is merited, especially the synergies between the goals of developmental pragmatism and the interests of more autocratic governments, of which Uganda is just one on the African continent. Thank you. So because the speakers were so good about keeping on time, we have about 25 minutes for Q&A, and I'll do the same thing that the last few panels have been doing, so I'll take three questions at a time. Okay, let's start up here in front. One, two, three. Let's make it easy. Yeah, thank you. Um, another very, very rich uh, and interesting uh, panel. Um, I would uh, actually have uh, two questions for Richard. Um, very interesting work uh, on Chinese uh, anti-Chinese populism, um, and I was wondering um, at some point in your pre presentation uh, you spoke about the sources of anti-Chinese populism, mm -hmm. and you also had this nice list on the screen. Mm -hmm. And something that uh, didn't come up, but that we discussed a lot uh, earlier this day, was infrastructure investments, large-scale infrastructure investments. Is this something that didn't come up in your research as a source of anti-Chinese populism, or did you just not mention it? It would be very interesting to see whether this is specifically excluded uh, and not there. It would be very interesting. Um, I think. And then I was wondering whether you'd see anti-Chinese populism as an isolated phenomenon or whether this is part of a broader trend that we see in African countries of growing importance of social movements. So uh, is it part of this uh, broader trend in social movements or is it an isolated pheno phenomenon as you see it? Uh, thank you so much for all your presentation. Uh, I have uh, a question for Professor Robert uh, uh, Rutu. And uh, so uh, in your discussion about the uh, industrial park project, uh, you mentioned this is the provincial, uh, is a project collaborate be between a provincial government from China and the uh, and, and the Uganda government. But also you, you keep mentioning uh, Mr. Shen. And uh, so in, in this case, who is really in power? Is, is the Chinese provincial government or is Mr. Shen? I want to you, uh, clarify more about that. And related to the question that you mentioned about the labor practice and also the, the racial consequence of this project. So from your point of view, uh, 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 and also following your field of research, do you think the Chinese uh, uh, Chinese actor, either Mr. Shen or the Chinese provincial uh, uh, government or provincial company, did they uh, have any consciousness about this consequence? Did they do this uh, unconsciously or they knew this consequence but they just do not care? And how do you make a distinction between these two? Thanks. Louis, just put it, pass it behind you immediately. Yeah. Thanks. My question is for Dr. Aidu. Um, you mentioned a, a list of countries uh, in which uh, 
Chinese, uh, anti-Chinese populism had been successful in fomenting a change of government and where it had not been. Aside from the particularities of Zambia's political system that allowed a change of government to occur, was there another tipping point in Zambia that pushed uh, public pressure over the edge that had not been met in other countries? Mm -hmm. Let's, let's take that round. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll respond to the infrastructure uh, argument. That is very much seen in most of the surveys. Most of the surveys that I looked at had some uh, mention of infrastructure also as a, uh, a source, particularly when it comes to uh, the parts where they see Chinese workers uh, working alongside African uh, workers. And, and I did say that uh, anti-Chinese sentiments are sometimes built from both myths and realities. So we do know that uh, Dr. Bradenham and others have probably uh, very much done lots of work to show how much uh, is going uh, in, into African workers in terms of these infrastructure projects. Uh, but these bits of statistics and information do not percolate down to the local people, and hence uh, most of the locals just go by optics. They walk by these infrastructure sites and they see uh, some Chinese uh, workers and they immediately, they immediately uh, show anger in that regard. Uh, there was one instance where I saw uh, I was with a fellow Ghanaian and we walked by a site and uh, haven't heard World Bank statistics of 48% of uh, Ghanaian youth being unemployed. Uh, he just looked at it and, and went, well, that's the reason why, right? Because uh, if we don't have access to that, uh, ignoring the fact that there were a few other Ghanaians that were working on uh, uh, the, these projects. So, Infrastructure definitely uh, is one that shows up in most of the surveys, except I had to be succinct and try to just keep uh, uh, the list shorter uh, uh, on the slide. Uh, and then secondly, uh, whether it's a broad uh, pattern or as one that you can see, this uh, is showing up more as African political systems uh, evolve and also China's uh, investments also evolve in other ways. So as they get into different sectors and uh, where there is more contact with Africans and or maybe very much differ, uh, you see uh, anti-Chinese sentiments emerge uh, along uh, those parts. So it's, it's partly part, uh, perceived as a broad pattern uh, that is showing up as China is getting uh, more and more invested in Africa. And uh, you clearly can see ones that produce uh, major uh, impacts are very few. So they are selected, but then also very much growing as uh, we see uh, China become much more involved and then African governments also become uh, uh, more open uh, to allowing the locals to be part of politics as well. And then uh, the other question is about the tipping point. Uh, Zambia was one particular case that you could clearly tell uh, was able to uh, use anti-Chinese sentiments to uh, engineer political change. And, and the tipping point, I'd say, is uh, partly when uh, SATA somehow ignited the copper industry, right? So talked about the copper industry, talked about how China and, and the quote that became very popular, China is, becoming, China is making a province out of uh, Zambia. Uh, that triggered much more so talking about jobs and uh, things that were very much connected to the local people, uh, where you actually can tell the robber meets the road, uh, you then see that anger uh, very much become uh, a palpable resource uh, to engineer political change. And so you can tell this in uh, other African countries where you see elements of anti-Chinese sentiments, but not yet still gathered as much steam to uh, engineer political change as uh, what I'm currently watching for. So in places like Ghana and in other places, we've seen elements of that, but not necessarily led to the uh, tipping point where uh, the government is actually addressing, connecting these things to the local people uh, in a way that moves them. 
Robert? Um, yeah, thank you for such an interesting question. And so the question again was, who is really in charge in this particular project? This businessman, Mr. Shen, or the provincial government officials? And um, basically, since the project was kind of formalized as an industrial park, this Mr. Shen, the private kind of businessman, became increasingly marginalized. Um, his name is in the name of the park, the Liao Shen Industrial Park, mm -hmm. um, but it almost seems as if that was kind of a token gesture. He retains control over this brick factory and other things, um, but he become, he has become a smaller scale player. And I think what's interesting about that question that might have more general kind of, kind of insights into these dynamics is that he's not being usurped by Chinese provincial government officials. He's being usurped by one of the private Chinese investors. Oh. And this is a man who um, actually has 15 years of business experience in, in Uganda, a Chinese man. And so he's a much larger scale kind of Chinese uh, businessman in Uganda. And he is very much running the show now. So it's con gone from a very small scale kind of local businessman to this much more kind of uh, national level uh, Chinese investor. Um, and then just the other interesting question about um, were they oblivious to the, volatility, the racial volatility of these things or not? And I would say that yes, my understanding of that, Mr. Shen very much underestimated how kind of some of the labor practices um, could really incite these conflicts. Um, and that there were actually kind of riots in the village before I started my field work. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think his changing of the labor practices was an attempt to accommodate that. And I think what's interesting is I feel like the current kind of power structure, the, the Chinese managers, the Chinese businessmen, and the, um, the government officials didn't learn from any of that. Um, and they seem to be kind of starting over again without any knowledge of this, even this very, very recent history of racial conflict. Thank you. Um, another round. Um, let's go to this side. Um, the woman in the front there, the um, guy in the check shirt, um, and then at the back. Thank you for very rich uh, presentations and research. Um, it seems to me that what most of the of of, of your presentations show is um, severe gov governance weakness in in the places where the Chinese investors um, went to to invest. Um, I was wondering, and, and, and a tendency to take advantage of, this, of these weaknesses by the stakeholders that, that are involved, and I was wondering if the panelists could tell us their thoughts on who do you think um, is responsible for taking advantage of that situation? Is it the Chinese investor that comes and takes advantage of a weakness in the governance, or is it the local politician or the national government that allows for this situation to, to take place? And how do you think, what recommendations could you give for improving this situation? The gentleman behind. Hi, Mike Drager with uh, the Africa Bureau at USAID. Uh, I have two questions. Um, Dr. Isaac, you brought this up. I'm just wondering, given all of your research, what are the implications of Sino-African children and the sentiments regarding children born to both Chinese and African parents? And Dr. Buckley, um, I was wondering, you touched on this point briefly of informal Chinese investments coming into new markets. Would you say that it's being strategized and employed in such a way that Chinese businesses and investors are looking to be formalized, it's a, it's a foothold into new markets, or it's just simply not been employed in a systematized enough way? Um, I have a question. Um, Introduce for, yourself, please. Oh, yeah. Um, my name is Kui Tang, and I'm a student at SAIS. I have a question for Professor Virut. So um, I'm very interested in your theory about culture, no, developmental idealism and developmental pragmatism, and you mentioned that they are totally independent from each other. But I have a source on it and would love to hear your comments. Do you think it might be like there are just different stages of different development rooted in? What I mean is that like 100 years ago, like when the West 
go to you know invest in the Africa. There, there'll probably be a lot of like profit driven, you know, profit centered, more pragmatic. What like what China is doing now? What China is like new developer and they didn't receive a lot of check and balance, balance especially from the civil society. Might that be like a, a potential in the future for the two paradigms to converge? Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, let me start by uh, responding to the general question about uh, where, where do you think we should place the blame? Um, so in, in, in 2006, when uh, this whole idea of uh, uh, illegal mining in Ghana was happening and there was a lot of backlash against um, Chinese involvement in illegal mining. One of the articles that I wrote, uh, uh, like opinion piece, was the silliness of blaming the Chinese for what's going on. Because I think it's silly. I mean, and I say that because, number one, the Chinese that comes to Ghana has no idea where the gold is in Ghana or, or that this backyard or this particular place there is gold or, so we have to go and dig. There is always some Ghanaian involved in this aspect. Mm. And that becomes possible. Like, think about it. How is it possible for a foreigner, the Chinese, to engage in mining that, an activity that is not, is not supposed to Legalism allowed to engage in it in the first place. So I think that there shows uh, some level of uh, weakness, not, 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 not uh, in the existence of a, of a regulation to deal with that, but largely the lack of political will to implement that, that uh, to, or to implement that particular policy, which is to prevent, and not just political will, but lack of capacity to do that. So um, that's, that's very important. So to me, to a very large extent, um, it, 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 it has to be the system that makes it possible for, for this activity to, to happen. Having said that, you also have to take note of the fact that um, it's interesting. When, when these things happen, the Chinese embassy has no idea how many Chinese are actually, in, how many Chinese are in Ghana. Because these are not, these are not Chinese people that have anything to do with the Chinese government, right? So that the Chinese embassy becomes caught up in this whole thing and doesn't know what to do because on the one hand, you don't want your Chinese nationals to be treated uh, unfairly by the Ghanaian authorities, but on, on the other hand, you, you can't control the activity. So much as I, I think that a lot of the blame has to go to the Chinese, I mean, the Ghanaian authorities, there's also an extent to which there has to be an increasing level of um, I wouldn't call it control, but the Chinese government, if it is concerned about its image in Ghana and across Africa, will have to do something about either educating its nationals on what the do's and don't when they come to uh, places like Ghana, because that's very important to me. And there was a very interesting outcome from the, from the Chinese embassy when they, they basically came out, which is very undiplomatic in some sense, to sort of criticize the Ghanaian government for arresting and detaining Chinese nationals, but, but also suggested in the press release something like that the Ghanaian government should call the media into order, right? Like, so there was a sense that the Ghanaian government could order the media to stop uh, the way they were reporting on what the Chinese were doing. So to me, largely the blame is on Ghana, but to a very large extent, uh, there's some work to be done on the Chinese side. Uh, when it comes to um, the impact on, on children that are left behind. I think, I think um, to a very large extent, my work shows that the Ghanaian policymaker is not very aware of the extent of the uh, impact of the actions regarding the deportations, for example. I think they see it, of course. Um, there was a huge backlash. In fact, the president of Ghana had to come out to op have this Operation Vanguard. And on that press, press conference, he said that he's willing to put his presidency on the line to, in dealing with the, the illegal mining because it was a huge backlash because this has happened before in 2013 and then it's happening again. So my idea is that, the, my view is that the, the um, how the government is dealing with 
uh, illegal mining, of course, shows that it is committed to doing something, but it hasn't weighed the implications of it, which is why one of the things that I'm finding in my own research last year in 2017 is that the economy in, in the Eastern region, in Aquitia, in the mining communities, is in serious trouble because my informal, the, the informal sector, which basically holds the economy in that part of the world, is, is gone because there's a ban on, on, on small scale mining. And of course, that is impacting on the community members that were engaging the Chinese. That, that, because the Chinese were not just there for, for, um, for the mining, but they were, even though it was in some sense illegal, but it was providing some level of support for the community members. So for the, those children um, that are left behind, I think it is now, the government is now becoming aware of the huge impact of its actions uh, on, 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 the, on the involvement of Chinese. Lala, you want to? Yeah, I, I would agree with what Isaac has said um, in relation to the question about weak governance. I think it goes beyond just governance weakness. It's really a governance blind spot in the sense that the responses that we see to these informal actors not only affect the, the informal, the small scale producers disproportionately, but they actually fo foster a vicious cycle of poor governance. So it's this inability to understand, you know, yes, you have Ill illegal mining or illegal logging or side trading of cotton, and you want that to stop from the perspective of let's improve the sector, let's, you know, we want our economy to grow. But in order to address that, you really have to understand why is that happening to begin with. And it's not happening because there are Chinese traders willing to engage. It's happening because people desperately need to have money to pay for school or feed themselves and are very you know, cash strapped. And so, yes, to some degree, the Chinese are taking advantage of that in the sense that there's a need on the ground and they're coming in and seeing these opportunities. But I think if you flip that around and see, you know, this is a vacuum that exists because of an inability to understand and grapple with, you know, the, the, the needs on the ground of, of people um, in the country and, and the formal governance structures and policy responses actually doing damage and further exacerbating that. Mm -hmm. So that this idea of, you know, they've now just crippled this sector in Ghana, and what do people do? You know, it's, it's not a solution. Um, so that's on the general question. Um, what we observed in terms of the, um, the question about Chinese engaging in the sector, and is it a foothold for longer term investment versus just sort of stopping there at the informal sector side. Across all three sectors, um, there was a willingness among, um, and to varying degrees, but among the Chinese actors who wanted to stay, those who you know, stayed for more than just kind of one season, to start to engage and conform and, and put in long-term investments. And so what we um, conclude from that is that Actually, when you look at these interactions, if you, you know, our starting point was to ask what are the Chinese doing and what, what, is, what are the relations, but, but actually a more useful question is how do short-term investors or traders act and what are the impacts versus longer-term actors who are shifting and engaging in the sector and, um, and transforming it in, in different ways, um, regardless of you know, whether they're Chinese or Indian or what their origin is. Yeah, so uh, my, my response this, to, to this question is probably pretty much the same. The idea of uh, local agencies sort of having uh, the government structures uh, to be blamed for this, but I have always uh, pointed to, and uh, in my time, the time that I spent in most of these places, these Galamse sites, uh, illegal mining sites uh, around the continent, I've come to realize uh, one thing, that we tend to blame uh, the government, structures that are very easy to hold accountable. Now, what we often ignore are the traditional rulers uh, in most of these places. So there are traditional rulers in these places that uh, 
it's very hard for the local people to be angry at. Uh, it's very hard to hold them accountable because most of these traditional rulers are perceived as almost ten gods in their uh, areas and hence cannot uh, be held accountable. Uh, and so they tend to be, they who are the uh, land, the custodians of the land, tend to complicate uh, the process. They sell land to external, to foreigners, and it's not only the Chinese. Uh, spending time in some of these communities, I met the Irish, I met uh, British. I met people from different parts who have come to purchase land and are engaging in uh, the same illegal mining uh, process. So it's not only uh, the Chinese. We just tend to pick on them because of the exacerbation and, and the numbers that are involved. But these traditional rulers are uh, the main causes. Uh, they uh, hide behind the scenes. It's very hard for the locals to be angry at them. Uh, it's hard for anybody to just point fingers at them. Uh, and so for us to be able to uh, deal with this, it's easy to vote out a government. We can vote out uh, a government. We can easily uh, hold the government accountable. We can push it to do things. Uh, but uh, we need to figure out a way of making the traditional rulers accountable. And I'll tell you what, this is not a popular thing. I probably say this in Ghana and they will chase me out. Uh, and because uh, that's the truth, how we've come to perceive these traditional rulers who hold on to land uh, would just keep this problem going until we figure out a way of just making them uh, accountable to the people uh, and the communities that uh, they live in. Thank you. And Robert? Briefly as possible. Sure. The only thing I would say, just like from my particular vantage point in the case that I'm studying, I think you do have this issue of governance weakness that's paired with this incredible distilled government strength. And I think uh, Dr. Walsh provided a very good sense of the incredible strength that's embodied in President Museveni and his immediate family and cronies. Um, and so there's a sense that, you know, there, I feel like the the governance weakness is everything else except for the Museveni inner circle. Um, and so it's maybe perhaps a, an extreme example, and as these African governments become more authoritarian, just it's a, both a distillation of government power and a complete erosion of governance beyond that, right? Thank you. If you would join me in thanking the speakers, we're at time. Oh, yeah. <laughs>